Uh, my name is Lee Reiners, and I'm the director of the Global Financial Market Center here at Duke Law. And today it is my privilege to welcome Peter Wallace into Duke. Peter holds the Arthur Burns Chair in Financial Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and is co-director of AEI's Program on Financial Policy Studies. Prior to joining AEI, Peter practiced banking, corporate, and financial law at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher in D.C. and New York. Peter has also uh, held a number of government positions. From June 1981 to January 1985, he was general counsel of the U.S. Treasury Department, where he played a significant role in the development of the Reagan administration's proposals for deregulation in the financial services industry. During 1986 and 87, Peter was White House counsel to President Reagan, and between 1972 and 76, he served as special assistant to New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, and subsequently as counsel to Mr. Rockefeller as vice president of the U.S. More recently, he served as a member of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, which was created by Congress in 2009 to investigate the causes of the great financial crisis. Peter details his time on the commission and the reasons for his dissent from the commission's majority opinion in his latest book, Hidden in Plain Sight, What Really Caused the World's Worst Financial Crisis and Why It Could Happen Again. Please join me in welcoming Peter to Duke. Thank you very much, Leah. You know, I must say I marvel at the convening ability of pizza. <laughs> at uh, the American Enterprise Institute, we serve a full lunch, and we can, can't get a crowd like this. So um, this is great. I'm going to recommend that we give up our kitchen and just start importing pizza. But thank you all for coming. I hope we'll have an interesting discussion today. Um, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the financial crisis, which is what this book is about, in a somewhat broader context. And that is how the financial crisis uh, eventually led to the election of Donald Trump. And w w however you feel about Donald Trump, um, I think there is a very close connection between those two events. And I'll try to explain why I think that's true. Um, first of all, what happened in the financial crisis? Um, most of us, I think, to the extent we've experienced it at all, it was in 2008, um, realized that there were some problems with mortgages. Uh, and mortgages failed, and a lot of financial institutions began to fail. And then all of a sudden, there was this terrible worldwide crisis uh, that uh, many people said endangered the entire financial system, not only ours, but the world's financial system. Well, the diagnosis for that uh, was that there's insufficient regulation of banks, and particularly Wall Street. This book uh, says, no, that isn't the reason we had a financial crisis. Um, we had it for we had it because of the housing policies of the United States government. And what I will do now is talk a little bit about the housing policies of the government, how they led to an incipient crisis, why bungling or blundering or whatever you want to call it by the government, as the crisis developed, uh, resulted in what we now understand to be or think of as uh, a worldwide uh, financial crisis. And then finally, how the diagnosis of that crisis uh, produced the election uh, that we had in 2016. So that might sound a little bit ambitious, but I think, I think I can do it in 30 or 40 minutes and then leave some time for some questions. All right, so let's, let's start first with the financial crisis. We all understand that the problem had to do with mortgages, very low quality mortgages, subprime mortgages principally. What you're seeing here on the screen is who was holding those mortgages in June of 2008. Um, at that time, a majority of all mortgages in the United States were what we would call subprime, which means that they were made to people who had very low credit scores, that is to say that they had many dings in their credit, and uh, they were not regarded as good credits. Or for other reasons, the mortgages were deficient, they were very low down payments and things like that. Um, so more than half of all mortgages in the United States were like that. 
But what you're seeing on your screen now is the fact that 76% of those deficient mortgages were where? They were on the books of the US government, through, principally through two agencies called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, which were government um, supported uh, mortgage companies that bought mortgages from banks and other originators and then packaged those mortgages largely into uh, mortgage-backed securities, which they then sold to investors here and, and around the world. But the blue in that, uh, in that stack on the left is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and just above that is uh, the FHA, Federal Housing Administration, and above that are other government agencies like the VA and the, and the uh, Agriculture Department, which also made loans. So 76% of all of these mortgages that everyone says caused the financial crisis were on the books of the government. And so you'd have to wonder when you, when you look at that whether deregulation was really, or lack of sufficient regulation, was really the problem in a mortgage crisis of the kind that we had. On the right, that little black box is what was owned by the, of these deficient mortgages that was owned by the private sector. So if we say that the government holds 76% of all these mortgages, then it's clear who created the demand for these mortgages. And that's the key to understanding the crisis. Because the government was the ultimate buyer of the mortgages. The banks and other originators were, in effect, intermediaries. The mortgages were, they, they, they went to the table um, when mortgages were made, when homeowners, uh, people came in to become homeowners, they went to the table, they provided the funds, but what they did in effect was simply sell those mortgages to um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac largely, or for FHA and, and other government agencies, because those agencies wanted those mortgages. Why? What you see on the screen now is something called the Affordable Housing Goals. Um, these were adopted in 1992 and were imposed on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, those two large mortgage companies. What do the Affordable Housing Goals do? Um, as initially adopted by Congress, they said, uh, when you are buying mortgages from banks and other originators, 30% of all the mortgages that you buy have to be made to people who are at or below the median income in the places where they live. In other words, um, at median income or just below median income, low income people in the places where they live. Um, the top line of these three is the basic rule. It started at 30%. By, by uh, 1996, it had become 40%. That is, 40% had to be made to people below median income. And by, I won't go through each of the, of the uh, increases, but by 2008, it was 56%. So 56% of all of the mortgages that were made, uh, in the, not all of the mortgages made in the United States, but all of the mortgages that were purchased by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, had to be made to people who were at or below the median income where they lived. Now, this, the affordable housing goals were administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So this was in both the Clinton administration, that is through, from 1992 through the year 2000, and then in the Bush administration. Um, they, HUD continued to raise the affordable housing goals. The two uh, lower categories that you can see there. Again, the black line is the increase. The red and the green lines are how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac managed to meet the goals in each year. Um, the two categories below that are mortgages made to very low income people and mortgages made to minorities because there were also categories in the HUD rules that required a certain number of uh, loans to be made to minorities and to very low income people, that is, people with incomes of 80 or 60% of median. Now, if you were required 
to find these mortgages, to have a quota of these mortgages, how would you do it? Before 1992, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were very famous for one thing, and that is they would only buy prime mortgages. Um, this left the uh, housing world in the United States in a position where 64% um, of, the, of um, the people in the United States were homeowners. That was the rate of home ownership in the United States, 64%. And the idea in 1992 was that, well, the reason it's only at 64% and not higher is that low-income people are, don't really have access to mortgage credit. That was the purpose of the affordable housing goals. And so the idea was if we, get, if we give low-income people much more opportunities to buy homes, they will, and we will increase the home ownership rate in the United States. Now, everyone is for home ownership. There's no question about it. But... This idea to force a credit to um, low-income people was a, a well-intentioned idea, but turns out not to have, um, I, I would think, satisfactory results. And I'll explain what happened there. So what you're seeing, though, is how these affordable housing goals increased over time. And if Fannie and Freddie were to meet these quotas, what do they have to do? They couldn't make prime loans anymore. A prime loan meant you had to have a credit score. I'll, I'll give you a number. Probably doesn't mean anything to you unless you tried to buy a house. But the credit score would be 660 or above. It's called a FICO score. It's a measure of your, of your willingness to meet your obligations according to your credit history. So uh, a, uh, a FICO score of 66 or above. Um, plus a down payment of about 10%, would have made that a prime loan before 1992. After the affordable housing goals went into effect, Fannie and Freddie found it very difficult to find prime loans when they were looking to meet this quota of people below median income. And so they began to reduce their uh, their underwriting standards. Fannie and Freddie were the, uh, I, I guess you'd, you'd say they were the major players in the U.S., and still are the major players in the U.S. Uh, financial system for mortgages. And so as the largest players, they were buying about 50% of all mortgages in the U.S. financial system in all these years. Um, they set the terms for underwriting standards. And as they began to reduce their underwriting standards so they could find more people who met the affordable housing goals, those standards spread to the rest of the economy. Uh, what I'm showing you here might be a little bit difficult to see from the back, but this, is, uh, this was published by Fannie Mae in 2008. And it's an excerpt from a, a larger uh, table that they published that year. And what it shows is that um, in 2008, if we go over to the right here, you see that they had $837.8 billion in what you would call deficient mortgages, that is subprime mortgages or other kinds of mortgages with low down payments or no, no amortization, things of that kind. So they had $838 billion of that, and that was about a third of all the mortgages that they were holding. And as they say in this report, 81.3% um, of all their losses came from these mortgages. So these were actually very dangerous mortgages to be holding. If you're suffering so many losses from these in, in 2008, it got worse as they went along, because those mortgages were there and were gradually defaulting, but 81.3% of their mortgages in, in that one year came from these deficient mortgages that they had bought. So, and, and of course, Freddie Mac did the same. Freddie Mac is slightly smaller than Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae has about 60% of all the business between the two of them and, and Freddie, the remaining 40%. So um, Fannie Mae was the dominant player here. And as you can see, they were buying a large number of these very low-quality mortgages, which caused them 
to suffer losses. Now, what does it mean when an underwriting standard declines substantially? Um, well, as I explained, because they were the dominant players in the housing finance industry, um, Fannie and Freddie set the standards for the industry on underwriting standards, and everyone followed them. So as their underwriting standards, standards declined, all underwriting standards declined in the country. And as a result, we see um, between about 1997 and uh, about 2007, we see a gigantic housing price bubble in this country. Now, if you were in the market at that time, if you were a homeowner at that time, you loved it because your house was going up in value about 10% a year. Um, and that was because of this gigantic bubble. How did we come to have a bubble like this? The answer is that if you think about what underwriting standards do, you can begin to understand why you would have such upward pressure on housing prices. Let's assume that someone has $10,000, he, she, they have saved to buy a home. If the underwriting standard is that you have to have a 10% down payment in order to buy the home, then you can buy a $100,000 home. However, if the underwriting standard is reduced to 5%, you can buy a $200,000 home. The difference is made up by more credit. So instead of borrowing $90,000 on a mortgage to, make, to buy that $100,000 home, you are now borrowing $190,000 to, make, to buy a $200,000 home. Now, the result of all this credit, we, in, a, in the business, we call it leverage. Uh, as a result of all this leverage, there was tremendous upward pressure on housing prices. And that's why the bubble came about. Because each year, as housing prices grew, people were able to buy, borrow more money from banks, buy more larger and more expensive homes, sell those homes and buy even more expensive homes. This was the game that was being played during this time. Now, ironically, this was the worst possible thing that could have happened to low-income people who wanted to buy homes. Because all of this pressure on rate, on, on uh, housing prices, resulted in the lowest price homes rising in cost far faster then the incomes of low-income people were rising. And so they were kind of priced out of the market. And people began, home builders and others began to focus on um, uh, the buyers of much more expensive, larger homes. And, and the starter home became something that was very, very difficult to get for the young families. All right, so we get to 2007. And this, this bubble tops out. And why is that? Well, no matter how concessionary um, mortgage rates and, and um, uh, mortgage contracts became, that is to say 5% down payment, 3% down payment, no down payment, a credit score of 660, then a credit score of 620, then a credit score of 580, um, all of those things began to disappear as Fannie and Freddie continued to reduce underwriting standards in order to meet the, meet the affordable housing goals. Um, and, but there comes a point where no matter how um, concessionary these, these loans become, people can't afford to buy the homes. They've gotten too expensive. And so the, the bubble topped out in 2007 and began to decline. When the bubble began to decline, suddenly we had a tremendous number of defaults. Why is that? Well, when housing prices are rising, especially like 10% a year, if you couldn't meet your mortgage obligation, you could always refinance your home. Because technically, if your house has gone up 10%, you now have 10% equity in the home that you didn't pay for. So people during this period of the bubble were able to constantly refinance their home, extend the, extend the mortgage period, and thus keep, stay in the home without defaulting on the mortgages. But unfortunately, it all came to an end. And when it did come to an end in 2007, then the defaults came in in unprecedented numbers. 
This was, I don't know how many of you are, are taking an accounting course, but um, if you have taken an accounting course, you, you understand that sometimes securities are uh, measured by market value, and many of the homes were, uh, were put into pools, and securities were issued backing those pools, and the securities are traded in an open market. Well, of course, when people in the market began to understand that there were an enormous number of defaults coming in on mortgages, they left. They fled the market. I don't know anything about this. I don't know how this could be happening, but the newspapers tell me it's happening. I'm getting out. In other words, there were very few buyers. And as there were very few buyers, the value of these mortgage-backed securities plummeted to near zero. Under accounting rules, if you are carrying uh, securities at a certain um, in, in a certain category, that is securities that you are willing to trade, um, which is the way most of the financial institutions were carrying them, they had to write down those securities to almost zero. That had a tremendous adverse impact on their capital positions, so they looked very, very weak. Um, and that's where things stood in early 2008. What you see here is not all of the market, but this is a little picture of what happened in the mortgage-backed securities market. Um, pretty healthy up through 2007, and then a tremendous plummet down in 2008 to almost no trading at all, and no issuance of these mortgage-backed securities at all. So here we, here we are in early 2008, We've got a serious mortgage problem on our hands in that there are many, many defaults going on. The mortgage-backed securities market was, as they say, in the tank. And the, and the financial institutions that were holding these mortgage-backed securities um, were also looking very weak. Their capital positions had been adversely affected by the decline in the value of the mortgages and the mortgage-backed securities. We come to March of 2008. And now we will get into why we had a financial crisis and not just simply a big mortgage problem. In 2008, one of the Wall Street firms, it was called an investment bank. It was in the commercial bank. It's not insured by the government um, or its deposits are not. It doesn't take deposits, but it's, it, it was in no way insured by the government. Name of the, name of the institution was Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns was in serious trouble because it had invested very heavily in this mortgage market while it was rising. It looked like a great deal to them and their customers and so forth. But now that the mortgage market was plummeting, Bear Stearns was in trouble. And it was going to fail. Now, it's a big firm. It's about a $450 billion firm. It was the smaller of the five big um, investment banks on, broad, on, uh, on Wall Street. Uh, Goldman Sachs and um, Morgan Stanley, uh, Lehman Brothers, uh, one I'm forgetting right now, but then, then there is um, Bear Stearns. Well, what does the government do when this big investment bank is failing? At the time, the, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury was John Paulson, not John Paulson, uh, uh, Hank Paulson, sorry, John Paulson was someone else entirely. Um, Hank, Hank Paulson was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, and he was very worried about credit default swaps. I won't go into what credit default swaps are now. They're not something to worry about, as it turned out. But he was very worried about credit default swaps. He thought, and I'm just using his autobiography as the basis for this position I'm outlining to you, um, he thought that all of these credit default swaps tied all of these businesses together. They were all interconnected. And if one of them failed, then the whole market would be tanked. Uh, everyone would fail. They'd fall into this gigantic hole. And that would be a worldwide crisis of immense proportions. And so he decided that the government would now step in and rescue Bear Stearns. Now, this was very, very unusual. Because although we all know about bank um, 
rescues of, of uh, large banks. That happens a lot, and the, and the FDIC generally handles those kinds of things. But for the very largest ones, the Fed sometimes gets involved and does that. But no one has ever done it for an investment bank. Um, a bank is a different quality entirely. A bank, a commercial bank, is insured by the government. Its deposits are insured by the government. People keep their payrolls. They keep their savings in, in commercial banks. But no one, no one puts his um, payroll or savings into an investment bank. You put your investments into an investment bank. Um, and that's what a lot of people had done. But to, to rescue an investment bank was very unusual and largely, I think, uncalled for. But they stepped in, the, the government stepped in with about $30 billion from the Federal Reserve and rescued uh, Bear Stearns by selling the firm to J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the biggest um, bank holding companies on Wall Street. So all of the creditors of Bear Stearns were saved because now they are creditors of J.P. Morgan Chase. Great deal for them. The shareholders of Bear Stearns suffered hugely, but they still came out with something. Um, but the important thing to recall is that the creditors of Bear Stearns were fully protected by this action by Hank Paulson and with the help of Ben Bernanke, who was the chairman of the Fed at the time. So everything is sort of going along. After that, people seemed reasonably comfortable with where things were going. Nothing was improving in the market because there were still lots of failing mortgages coming in. Um, but if you looked at, the, at some of the measures of risk in the market, like uh, credit default swaps and so forth, they were kind of stable, running along and sort of an even keel above where they were when things were in good shape, but not reflecting panic. Um, and then in early months of September of 2008, uh, Hank Paulson, looking at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, these two gigantic government agencies holding about $5 trillion in, mor five trillion dollars in mortgages, um, looked as though they were going to become insolvent. And so he decided to take over. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you couldn't really put them into bankruptcy because they were so important to the survival of the housing finance system that they had to be managed in some way and, and kept going by the government with an inflow of funds to them to keep them at least um, uh, stable. So he stepped in in early September and took out with, again, support from the Fed, stepped in to save Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. The effect of this on the market was very interesting and important to understand. Most people did not know how many subprime mortgages were outstanding. Um, the media didn't cover it. When I was working on my book and when I was working on my dissent from the, um, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, um, I look back into uh, the internet to find anything about what kinds of subprime mortgages, how many people knew what kinds of poor quality mortgages were outstanding. And I found nothing. Mo there were some people who were aware that there were subprime mortgages, but nothing like the number that were outstanding. And in fact, as re in researching for my book, I found that the Fed, in its discussions, just before the Fed stepped in um, at, with, with Bear Stearns, thought there were about 6 million subprime mortgages outstanding. In fact, there were 18 million subprime mortgages outstanding, at least. So the Fed itself, with its 3,000 economists, with its tentacles all over the country, measuring what's going on in the, in the economy, knew nothing about this most serious problem. Um, so. Here's Paulson. He comes in, and he rescues Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, the fact that people didn't understand 
how many subprime mortgages were outstanding and whether the subprime mortgages were causing the problem, um, and didn't understand that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had been buying these mortgages to meet the affordable housing goals, were stunned by the fact that Fannie and Freddie might be insolvent. Because people continued to assume that Fannie and Freddie were doing what they had always done, and that is they only bought prime mortgages from banks and other originators. And so if Fannie and Freddie were insolvent, that meant there was a gigantic problem in the whole housing system, not just a subprime mortgage problem. That turned out to be an error. It was a, a subprime mortgage problem, but people didn't understand this at the time. And so investors raced for the doors. And the next target was Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was about 50% larger than Bear Stearns. It was about $650 billion. And it was rocky. It was not insolvent, according to Lehman Brothers and its accountants, but it was rocky. And when people think that the entire housing system is coming apart and started to withdraw their investments from Lehman Brothers, it, be, it came to the point where it looked like Lehman Brothers would fail. OK. You have rescued Bear Stearns in March of 2008, the $450 billion company. And then here comes Lehman Brothers, and it's a $650 billion company. What do you do? At that point, I'd say, um, from all indications, from communications he had and so forth, the Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, lost his nerve. He said, well, you know, they're calling me Mr. Bailout. And he was getting a lot of criticism from people like me, for example, who were saying that you didn't have to rescue Bear Stearns. That was a foolish thing to do. Nothing would have happened if Bear Stearns, Stearns was allowed to fail. A lot of economists were saying the same thing. and, and especially conservative economists. And Hank Paulson was being called Mr. Bailout. And he decided that because of that, um, he would not step in and rescue Lehman Brothers. If he, couldn't, if he wouldn't do it, and he was the, uh, the political official, the Fed couldn't do it because the Fed can't take a step as important as that without the approval of the political organs. And Hank Paulson had said, they're calling me Mr. Bailout. I'm not going to do it. So Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail. Now, it was allowed to fail over a weekend. No one had any idea that Lehman Brothers was going to declare bankruptcy. And on Monday morning, um, September 15, they declared bankruptcy. This was an incredible shock to the market. And you can imagine why. Because they had all assumed that the government had established a policy with the regulation, with the, with the saving of Bear Stearns, they'd established a policy that these very large financial institutions would not be allowed to fail. Um, and so Lehman Brothers, if it failed, fine, OK, the government would step in and rescue Lehman Brothers, as it did with Bear Stearns. So the creditors of Lehman Brothers, by and large, stayed in place. Um, they were willing to sit there because the likelihood was that uh, Lehman would be rescued and they would be saved the way the Bear Stearns creditors were saved. But that didn't happen. And so all of these people then, all of these investors, all of the people who thought they knew what the world looked like in front of them were wrong. And that's why we had an enormous crisis at that point. Um, the, the world fell in, in effect, because so many people now were frightened about where things really stood. Who is going to be rescued? Who isn't? Who, had, who is able to survive this and who isn't? And they were running to financial institutions and trying to get their funds out. And that's when the Fed then stepped in and started providing funds to the market so that um, they could theoretically avoid additional failures. Now, I won't go into any more of that. But that's why we had a crisis. We had government policies that weakened the financial system through all the things I, the housing policies that I talked about. A blunder in, I think, in rescuing Bear Stearns and then not rescuing Lehman. If you rescued Bear Stearns, you had to rescue Lehman because everyone was relying on it. But they shouldn't have rescued Bear Stearns in the first place. Okay, so there we are. 
Um, we've, we've gone through all of, these, all of these parts. What significance does all this have for Donald Trump? Um, uh, the, as I said at the beginning, the financial crisis was diagnosed as a problem of insufficient regulation. This was done um, without any investigation by Congress or anyone else about what actually caused the financial crisis. That's in my book. Um, and I dissented from the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission's report because I believed that it was the government's housing policies that caused the financial crisis and not lack of regulation. The book is a kind of a continuation of that, much more data. I was able to get a lot of data out of the files of the FCIC, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, that they had not put in their report. And I just should mention this. I should show this to you, because I thought this was pretty shocking. This was reported. This was, uh, well, actually, it was June 30, 2009. I showed you this before. So this was published while the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission was in being and doing its investigation of what caused the financial crisis. This was not in their report. And in their report, they said, well, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were just marginal. They weren't important to this. What was really important was the fact that all these Wall Street firms were playing games with all this money and um, had uh, caused the crisis by uh, being greedy. Um, but this is, this, this, if they'd looked at this, if they'd taken one look at this chart, they would have understood where most of these bad mortgages had gone. They had gone to the government and principally to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Okay, let's go back then to this. Because the diagnosis of the crisis was that there was insufficient regulation of the financial system, especially Wall Street. Now, you have to realize that that diagnosis protected a number of people. The government, for one, which had terrible policies leading up to it, and I'm talking first about Clinton administration, followed by the Bush administration, both parties. This is not a partisan issue. Um, the government had followed terrible housing pro policies, which had caused the crisis. But no one wanted to investigate the housing policies. The government didn't, and clearly, um, the, the people who had in Congress and elsewhere who had always supported these policies didn't want to do it. Congress wanted to act as though the cause of the financial crisis was insufficient regulation, and they adopted something called the Dodd-Frank Act. Dodd-Frank Act, adopted in 2010, was the most restrictive legislation on the financial system since the New Deal and probably more restrictive than anything uh, that passed constitutional muster, at least, in the, in the New Deal. Um, and it has had a major effect on economic growth in the United States. I guess probably many of you are beginning to see where I'm leading with this. Um, but the, the black line is recoveries from recessions since the middle 1960s. And the gray line is, is, that's the average, the black line. The gray line is where all of the recoveries were. The red line is the recovery from 2010 on, which is the recovery under the Dodd-Frank Act. The Dodd-Frank Act has had many adverse consequences for the financial system, much less credit available to business, a general sense that you can't really do anything without getting the government's approval because there are so many new regulations. Um, we, we really can't take the risk of starting out in a new business. We have to uh, pull back. Um, and so we've had uh, much higher rates of unemployment, much, high, much lower rates of family income growth over this period. And the standard diagnosis of what happened in 2016 is that. And that is that um, the American people, at least many people in the United States, not on the two coasts, um, are feeling the pinch of the fact that um, economic growth is not incurring, that good jobs are not available, and um, there are, there's a lot of malaise 
and anger. And that, I think, at least according to, and I'm not a political scientist, but there's a, that could have likely been the reason for the election of Donald Trump, a very unusual candidate, um, in 2016. So now you see it. You can understand why now it's very important to understand what actually has caused something that you're trying to legislate about. If you just say, well, it was lack of regulation, that's why we don't have to look at any of these other issues, which is what essentially the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission did, exactly what Congress did in 2008, and, two, and 2008, 2009, and then adopted uh, Dodd-Frank in 2010. That's exactly what they did. The, the problem they were solving was not the problem. And today, although Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are under the control of the government, uh, there's a government conservator who is basically running them. They are following the same policies. And if you look in the newspapers, it's not always presented in the right way, but you will see that the housing prices are beginning to rise. And they are beginning to rise because Fannie and Freddie um, are offering very concessionary rates. When they buy mortgages from a bank or another originator, they will buy a mortgage that has a 3% down payment. Um, that causes housing prices to rise. Startup homes are still not available. People who can afford more homes uh, because they have uh, larger homes, because they have more income, are able to buy these homes, but the prices are rising because they are able to get credit instead of just using their savings, so these prices will continue to rise as leverage increases. And that's the end of the story. We are on our way to exactly what happened in 2008. It won't change unless government housing policies change. And in addition, there are a couple of things in the Dodd-Frank Act that could also cause a crisis. I won't go into it unless you ask questions about them, but the Volcker Rule, for example, had, which is part of the, um, the Dodd-Frank Act, the Volcker Rule has, according to studies by Fed economists, has reduced the amount of liquidity in the entire financial system to dangerous levels. And so um, some failures of big companies now, which ordinarily could be handled by the liquidity in the system, might not occur. Um, the liquidity isn't there. People who want to sell their securities can't sell their securities because there aren't any buyers, or very few. And that's one possibility. Again, the Dodd-Frank Act also does something with clearinghouses. I don't know how many of you have been studying clearinghouses, um, but the Dodd-Frank Act requires that a lot of um, transactions go through clearinghouses. Um, where you essentially put the clearinghouse between the two parties in a counterparty system, and the parties entrust the clearinghouse to take the money from one and pay it to the other when it's due. Um, but now the clearinghouses are backed by the Fed because Congress in the Dodd-Frank Act said it was possible now because they were worried about interconnections that would cause another financial crisis um, the Congress said, well, now the Fed will back these clearinghouses. And the Fed is backing the clearinghouses. So we are in exactly the same position as we were with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, backed by the government. No one cared whether they were taking risks because the government was going to be covering them. And the same thing will be true of these clearinghouses. So not only did the diagnosis of the crisis produce a law that stifled economic growth in this country and had political consequences, but it also created the possibility of yet more crises in the future because it, is set, it set up exactly the kinds of mechanisms that would cause a crisis in the future. So that's all I have to say right now, and I'd be delighted to um, take any questions that you have. Thank you.